Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the keynote of the Bay Area Book Festival, fourth annual festival. So my name is Sherilyn Parsons. I'm the founder and director of the festival. Thank you. Thank you so much. It takes a village. You know, something like a thousand people come together to put on this festival. So yeah, so we really, we appreciate your support and I hope you've had a great day going to a lot of events. I sure have. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it is my enormous honor to present our keynote speaker of the festival and really the session that is the anchor in terms of the theme of the festival this year, which is this book, The Common Good, and our moral authority of our time, Robert Reich. Um, Robert Reich doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, so I'm going to just tell you a couple, of, a couple of facts, some of which I'm sure you already know. He is the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. His classes are among the most popular at the university, and I've heard that you can actually go and sit in on some. So, anybody done that? I've, I've heard you can, yes, people have done that, yeah. Um, he was also the Secretary of Labor under President Clinton, and Time Magazine um, voted him or, or named him as one of the 10 most effective cabinet secretaries of the 20th century. So, yeah, pretty, pretty impressive. He's written 15 books, and uh, one of them that sort of struck my, my eye when I was looking at the list was called Beyond Outrage, and it was published in 2012. And you can just imagine, I mean... <laughs> How can we go beyond, beyond, beyond outrage or something? I don't know. Maybe he'll talk a little bit about that. So, you know, Saving Capitalism, I mean, you've, you've seen many of his books. He also has two documentaries that he co-created, um, Inequality for All and Saving Capitalism. Inequality for All is now on uh, Netflix, which you can watch on, yay, on Netflix. And um, he's chairman of Common Cause, and he has two and a half million Facebook followers, if you can believe it, pretty impressive. And um, yeah, where does this guy get the time to uh, join us today, which we really appreciate that he's, he's made the time for us um, today, and um, really, truly a moral authority of our time, and um, this book, The Common Good, I encourage you to get it after the session. He will be signing after the session. Um, this book, you know, as I was saying to him backstage, I kept sort of waiting for him to like lay in to the current administration and what was going on, and he didn't. He, he stayed gracious, the way Obama stayed gracious, the whole way. And he really looked at how the democratic process is a thing we need to adhere to and we need to treasure and we need to protect today. And his whole tone of this book um, stayed, stayed with that, conveyed that. He practiced what he preached in this book. It's really well worth reading. Um, so what we'll do is he'll talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take your questions for another half an hour, 45, however long he'll be willing to go, and then sign your books afterwards. So let me, uh, please join me in warmly welcoming Robert Reich to the Bay Area Book Festival. Hello. Very nice to see you. Well, what a pleasure to be with neighbors and friends here in our bubble. Uh, as you can see, uh, Trump wore me down. I mean, I, when I moved to Berkeley, I was 5'10", and it is, it is amazing. Uh, I don't know, every day people come up to me and they say, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear what he did? Did you hear what he did today in Michigan at the rally? First of all, I don't, I've never heard of a president. I don't want this to be all about Trump, by the way. I, and I will move away from Trump, but I, I want to just, I have to therapeutically get some of these things out. <laughs> did you? But today, he's in Michigan and he's having a rally. I don't, I don't have never heard of a president having rallies for himself, and these are what, basically these are rallies for himself. These are not about Democratic or, I mean, these are not Republican candidates, not about Republican Party. Uh, we're, you know, we're more than two years away from the election. These are rallies about Donald Trump. And he said in the middle of this rally, uh, uh, he, he criticized somebody in the press, again, fake news, for saying that maybe Donald Trump doesn't get credit for North and South Korea 
you know, moving toward maybe some sort of an agreement or, or Kim and, and Moon coming together. And he said, uh, Moon said, just on the phone to me, he said, we get all the credit. I, I get all the credit. He said, I get the credit. Now, <laughs> some of you may be managers and may be executives. Some of you may be in charge of people. You know, one of the most important things you can do when you are in charge of a group, or helping a group, or helping an organization, is give credit. In other words, when good things happen, you always want to give credit to others. When bad things happen, you want to, you know, basically say, I'm sorry, the buck stops here. And we have a president who does the opposite. Every dimension of morality, every dimension of management, every dimension of democratic theory and practice. Okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, but, but here, you know, okay, last week I was coming back. I was coming back from Boston, and I'm in airports. Airports are a kind of free-floating focus group for me. Uh, because people, people I don't know, I've never seen in my life, and I think it's partly because I'm so conspicuous looking. They come up to me, and they will say to me, and this is what, uh, uh, the, coming back from Boston, somebody I never saw in my life, she came up and she just said, can you believe it? I said, no. <laughs> People come up to me, I don't know, they say, in airports, they say, what are we going to do? <laughs> I say, I don't know. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> vote, yes, vote. We'll come back to that soon. Uh, but let me just say a, a few things. I, I really think that Trump is the consequence, not the cause, of a lot of our problems. I think that he is the culmination of decades of not paying attention. And by that I mean, uh, and I have to go through a little bit of autobiography here, because I do feel myself implicated to some extent in all of this. Uh, because when I was young and I was short, I was always very short. I was short when I was young and I'm short now. And what, but when I was young I was even shorter. I was very short. When I was a boy, I was very short. And uh, other boys used to beat me up. Now everybody, almost everybody is bullied in school, uh, but I was really bullied, and I, in order to save myself from the bullies, I mean, I realized at a very early age that I needed uh, protection, and I needed older boys, usually older boys, to protect me, so I made alliances with a few older boys. I had a kind of protection racket, <laughs> let's call it that. And so I sought out uh, boys who were older, and there were, you know, in grade school, there were a few of them, and then uh, the summers uh, I spent up with my grandmother uh, up in the Adirondack Mountains, there were a couple of them. And then in the summer of 64, um, I learned, I was just about going to college, and I hadn't seen most of my protectors. By that time, I could take care of myself, and most people who were bullies you know, they were not physical bullies. I mean, I could handle other kinds of bullies. Uh, but in that summer of 64, I learned that one of the boys who had been one of my protectors uh, named Mickey, I knew him by the name Mickey. Mickey had been registering voters in Mississippi. And he, Mickey Michael, Michael Schwerner, along with two other civil rights workers, had been tortured and murdered. 
near Philadelphia, Mississippi, by the sheriff of Neshoba County and some other thugs. And when I heard that my protector, as a small kid, from the bullies had been murdered by the real bullies, it really changed my life in, in the sense that I began to understand that we all have an obligation, not just me, we all have an obligation to protect people from bullying. And it's not just physical bullying, it's economic bullying, it's all of the ways in which people, particularly people who don't have much of a voice or who don't have much power in society are picked on and bullied and mistreated and maltreated and kicked around. And so I almost unconsciously, not with any sense of moral purpose, certainly I didn't say to myself in those terms, but I did think that I had to do something. I, I, I had to be active, be engaged. And so uh, by the time I was a senior, the Vietnam War was heating up, and many of you remember those years. I can see from some of your faces that you probably do remember some of those years. Uh, and uh, I got involved in the anti-war movement, and I went clean for Jean McCarthy. Anybody here <laughs> clean for Jean? And I went out to several states. Uh, and I also, uh, in that time, I, I, I interned, made my life a little bit complicated, but I interned in the Senate office of Robert F. Kennedy. And uh, I was in charge of Robert F. Kennedy's, it wasn't a glamorous job, believe me, believe me, but in some small way, I thought that I was, you know, his brother had said, ask not what America can do for you, but what you can do for America, and, and that, between that and Mickey Schwerner uh, and Robert F. Kennedy uh, and the Civil Rights Movement and all of that, I felt that I, you know, I was going to do something, and I went and was his intern, but I was in charge of his signature machine. <laughs> this was not a glamorous job. This was just, this was basically taking uh, the uh, letters uh, that had been typed to the constituents, you know, that you know, all of it from New York State, and uh, putting them, lining them up very carefully, so that at the end of a, and there was a pen, at the, this was pretty primitive, a pen at the, at the end of a wooden uh, thing that you had to not only turn it on, a little motor, but also line up the letters very carefully so that the pen would write Robert F. Kennedy. And I did that for months. I mean, I was going out of my mind. I was trying, I was trying to be go, I was trying to do my bit, you know, for America and trying to protect the, the unprotected. And I was trying to, but this was really a test of my capacity. Uh, so after three months, I, I, uh, I was in the hallway in the Senate office building and out of the elevator came Robert F. Kennedy. First time I had seen him, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I was absolutely in awe. I must have had my jaw dropping to the floor, and he said, how's the, how's the summer going, Bob? <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Bob. He he knew my name. I mean, I was running the signature machine. <laughs> he didn't ever come in to see me run the signature machine. He didn't even know he had a signature machine. <laughs> he didn't even know I existed, but he obviously did because he came out of the elevator. He wasn't planning to come out of the elevator. He didn't know I would be standing there. And he said, how's the summer going, Bob? And I, of course, 
nothing came out of my mouth. I, I went, uh, and he went on down the hallway, and, and that was my meeting with Robert F. Kennedy. But I was inspired. I mean, this is the opposite of taking credit and being, you know, treating other people like dirt. This was actually respecting somebody who was working for him, who had certainly no voice, certainly no power, certainly no standing, but by just knowing my name, he made me feel honored. And if he had asked me to run that signature machine for the next three years, I would have done it. And therein kind of lies, I think, some of the foundations of where I found myself. I got to Berkeley briefly as a graduate student. I thought I was going to be an architect. So I found a professor of architecture. Some of you may remember him, Sim van der Rijn. Does that name ring a bell? Does it? He's one of the founders of green architecture. And I don't remember how I find him, found him or how he found me, but I worked for him. I remember, you know, I came up University Avenue, first time I'd ever been to Berkeley. I came up in my, my beat-up little Volkswagen Bug. Everybody had a beat-up Volkswagen Bug. <laughs> and I came up uh, University, and I remember that first, first the first time I, I inhaled this... this combination of eucalyptus and marijuana and tear gas. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was just exhilarating. I thought, I thought I had arrived, uh, and I thought maybe, maybe architecture, maybe green architecture, maybe somehow that could, maybe I could make a contribution doing that. I wasn't sure. But and we worked together, and Sim and I did produce a little book that uh, I think five people read, I, maybe four. No, two. Um, and, uh, but I still, like most people, like most young people, I was still finding my way. I, I was very motivated, but I didn't know motivated for what. I, I know I, I, I did have this sense that the country needed to be fixed, but I didn't know how to fix it. I had a deep moral, and again, I, I use that term advisedly because I didn't talk in those terms to myself, but I did want to somehow make people better off and protect people, but I didn't know how. By the way, uh, well, I got to law school. I, I went to, for, because I didn't know what to do. I, had, I got a graduate fellowship uh, to Oxford, and then I went to law school. Uh, at Oxford, I met uh, on the boat, actually. We all went over. I got a Rhodes Scholarship, and we went over on the boat to Oxford, the 30 Rhodes Scholars. Those days, there were no women who were allowed to be Rhodes Scholars. Uh, if there had been, I would never have got a Rhodes Scholarship because there were only a limited number of Rhodes Scholarships, and the women would have probably taken most of them. Uh, but we were fortunate, us 30 men who were still men. And we got the Rhodes Scholarships, and on the boat going over to England, I got very sick. We went in a boat, that was the tradition. I got very sick, sick, seasick, a terrible boat. And I went down to my cabin, and there was a knock on the door. And, uh, and I, was, I, was, I almost didn't open the door, but I opened it, and there was this tall, gangly southerner you know, with chicken soup in one hand and crackers in the other. And he said, uh, in a drawl, I, w I wish I could imitate it, I can't. He said, hi, I'm, I'm Bill Clinton, and I hear you aren't feeling well. And I, I almost barfed, right, <laughs> right on the future president of the United States. But I didn't, I, I, thought, I thanked him, but that was the beginning of a, of a friendship. And I, uh, I, I stayed in touch with him for a number of years. And then we went to law school. And the first day of law school, 
uh, we were sitting there and we were talking about uh, Oxford and talking about what we wanted to do in life. He was trying to decide between, he did, wasn't sure he was going to run for governor uh, of Arkansas, he said. He, he said he was going to run for governor. I thought that was so, pres, pres, it was presumptuous and preposterous. How could somebody at that age think that they were going to be governor of a state? I mean, now even though there were more cows in Arkansas than people, it didn't matter. It was still a kind of a, I, w I was awed in a way by that. Uh, but just as he was talking about that, uh, a, a, a young woman, law student, uh, came up and she said, Bob. And I, uh, I turned around and uh, it, was, it was a woman who I remembered from Wellesley. She had been undergraduate at Wellesley when I had been undergraduate at Dartmouth and I had actually dated her once. Her name was Hillary. <laughs> Hillary Rodham. And she said, Bob, how are you? I said, I'm, I'm great, Hillary. Hillary, I want you to meet a friend of mine from Oxford. This is Bill. Bill, this is Hillary. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't. <laughs> it obviously did not take, because they think that they met in the law school library two weeks later. No, they met the first day. I introduced them. Remember that. It's Now still, I don't know that I had yet made any contribution to America in terms of... In fact, some might say that I had pulled the country backwards by that time. <laughs> but... And I'm not going to tell you about my date with Hillary. <laughs> Should I? Yeah. What, do you th what do you think back there? Should I... You want to know about, well, I'll tell you a little bit. Because I, I had forgotten all about it until 2008 when a reporter for the New York Times, this is absolutely true, the reporter for the New York Times called me and said that he had come across a collection of her letters from college, Hillary, by that time Hillary Clinton's letters from college, and she, of course, was running for president, or in the primary, she was running in the Democratic primary, and he said, the New York Times reporter, he said, she mentions you in her letters, and she went on, apparently, she went to a movie with you, uh, and uh, is there anything you can tell me about that date that might shed light on how she would function as president? <laughs> And I put my tongue firmly in my cheek and I said, well, all I can remember is that we went to a movie and she, she wanted an inordinate amount of butter on her popcorn. <laughs> and then there was a long silence. I said, are you still there? He said, yes, I'm just writing this down. <laughs> and then it appears in the New York Times. Seriously. We have to talk about the press at some point tonight. And if I don't talk about it, we'll get it to you in your questions, because we'll have time for your questions. Uh, so uh, I was still struggling, trying to find my way and trying to figure out what I was doing. And, and I had been you know, to Yale Law School, and I didn't know. I still didn't know what I was, was, was going to do. I, I clerked for a wonderful man named Frank Coffin. Uh, but uh, that just postponed everything. The war was getting worse and worse. Nixon was elected. Anybody, by the way, who thinks things are tough now and bad now, you know, the year 1968, those of us who remember 1968, you remember the cities were burning down. America was deeply divided. The war was heating up. It was a, a horrible year. There were, you know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated that year. And then, to top it off, Richard Nixon became president. I mean, think about all of that. Well, I didn't know what I was going to do, and I got an offer to go to government 
to go to the United States government. Now, you have to understand, and those of you who are my age or around my age will understand, uh, in those days, uh, there was still a lot of nobility around serving in government. I wish there were now. I, I think there is. In fact, I would advise young people and do advise young people to go into government. We need talented people. It is a noble profession. Uh, but then it didn't seem that unusual. Somebody like me, I've been to law school and I, I wanted to make the country better. Well, why not go to government? And I had an offer. But here's the thing. This was an unusual offer. This was an offer to join a Republican administration. This is the Ford administration. And the offer came from, you ready for this? I mean, I look back on this, I, I, I find it bizarre. The offer came from a man named Robert Bork. <laughs> so here I was, idealistic, wanting to change the country, wanting to protect people who were needed protection, and wanting to, and I was working, working in Washington as Robert Bork's assistant, assistant to the Solicitor General. This is the man who had fired Archibald Cox. Now, what was I doing there? I don't know. I mean, he and I, I he and I disagreed on, well, he was Solicitor General, so he was in charge of arguing Supreme Court cases. And he and I disagreed on the first, second, fourth, fifth, eighth, and ninth amendments to the Constitution. <laughs> so I, I thought it would be an intellectual challenge, but it was a terrible mistake. I argued, I did argue a couple of cases before the Supreme Court uh, in, in, on issues that I, I could at least excuse myself for arguing. They actually, they seemed pretty good. I was not good at it. I was very bad at it. Uh, my first argument was a case that was so difficult. They assigned it to me because it was, no, it was impossible to win. And they figured if they gave it to me, it didn't matter. And I remember I made an argument that was very hard. And Potter Stewart was one of the justices. And I, he asked me a terrible question. I mean, the worst question you can ask in terms of trying to, trying to get at the core problem with the government's case. And he asked me the question, and I couldn't answer him. And I tried to answer him, and I was embarrassed. And I said, and that is the, the United States position, Mr. Justice Stewart, uh, Mr. Justice Brennan, Mr. Just, and I couldn't even remember his name. <laughs> and he said, my name is Mr. Justice Potter Stewart, and Mr. Justice Brennan is sitting down at that end, and they waved at each other. <laughs> and giggled, and I knew that I had been, I was in the wrong job. Um, you know, I tell my students, in fact, uh, last Friday, today's Saturday, so yesterday, was the last day of classes at Cal, and I had my last class, and I have a big undergraduate class, and I love teaching, and I love Cal, uh, but what I tell these students, and because it was their last class, most of them were seniors, are seniors, but now I say we're seniors because they are graduated. They are, what, what, what are you? Between the time you are, you have your last class, you're no longer a senior, but you're not graduated. So there must be, anyway, whatever these people are. <laughs> um, I said to them, uh, and I say every year, but I said to them again, you're gonna fail. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. I want you to know in your careers, in your career paths, you're going to fail. The important thing is not succeeding or failing. Be prepared to fail. The important thing is resilience. The question is, can you get up when you've made bad decisions, when you have just blown it? Can you get up and recover and try to get back on track? And, well, I had made a terrible decision working for Robert Bork. I don't know why I did it. I was kind of, I guess, I, I guess the glamour of it attracted me. But I did try to get back on track, and I worked for Jimmy Carter, and that was a great, I, I thought he was a great man. I really did. <laughs> and he still is a great man. Uh, I think he's certainly the, great, the greatest post-president we have ever had in this country. I really think so. 
Did anybody see uh, Fritz Mondale, Walter Mondale, when he was here last, last week? Anybody? Because uh, he's also remarkable. I mean, these, these, are, these are people, these are men who are in their mid-90s and are sharp and witty and they remember everything and they're committed and they, they just, they're just remarkable. Both of them are amazing. Anyway. Uh, so I, I enjoyed working for Jimmy Carter. I thought I, I felt like I was sort of getting back on track a little bit, and then I went to teach at Harvard, uh, and that was a terrible mistake. <laughs> Anybody here? <laughs> Harvard. Well, Kennedy School. Kennedy School. That's where I taught. I was there. Was I there when you were there? Did I teach you? No. Oh. Did I teach you? I taught you? What's your name? Marty. Marty. You got an A minus. Right? Right? I d I, didn't I? You did. Um, Look, th there's a big difference between Harvard and University of California. The students are no better, no worse. Their, the students are exactly the same. They're, they're terrific students, both places. But at Harvard, the culture at Harvard is everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people, most people, certainly faculty, feel that in every conversation it's very important to prove to whoever they're talking to that they deserve to be on the Harvard faculty, that they're smart. Uh, and I felt that I had made another mistake. And then Bill Clinton called me one day. Uh, he had been elected president. And uh, I said, Bill, you've been elected president. And he said, yeah, that's why I'm calling. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, I don't know, if you ever have a friend who's elected president, I, I, you know, it really is a weird feeling. Because first of all, you don't know what to call them anymore. Because everybody else is calling them Mr. President or Mr. President-elect. And there's a lot of fawning and everybody, everybody is kind of, I mean, it, you know, they, they become a different person. They no longer are a person. They're sort of an object. They're kind of a, a messiah-like thing. And I was on the phone, and I said, Bill, what, what can I do? What, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I want you to come down and run my economic transition team. And I said, well, I don't know what an economic transition team is. <laughs> Wouldn't you do better getting somebody who's had some experience doing this? He said, no, no, I want you to come down. and I." And uh, I did, and I left Harvard, and I went down to Little Rock. And uh, in the kitchen, Hillary and Bill's kitchen, in their well, they, I guess it's it's a it's a governor's mansion, but in Little Rock, it was it was more modest than what we might think of as a governor's mansion. And we kind of talked about what Bill Clinton wanted to do, and and what he wanted, how he wanted to staff his cabinet, and who he wanted, and. And, uh, and, and, the big, and the big issue, the big, here, this is how this all connects together. You may just think that I'm just riffing with no, <laughs> there is a purpose here. Because the, the big idea, I had, I had written a couple of books and, and he and I had talked over the years about the importance of investing in people, in education, in job training, in health care, and my argument, and I think the argument that he picked up on, and he agreed, and maybe it was his argument, I don't because we had talked about it for so many, the argument was the, the way you build an economy, the way you actually build an economy is from the bottom up. You invest in people, and that's how the economy becomes stronger and stronger. And if the economy is, in, is based upon investments in people, then not only is the economy stronger, but you build and enlarge the middle class. 
and more people who are poor have a chance to move into the middle class. And, but you, you can only do that, obviously, if you make those investments. The public investments are as important as private investments. Public investments are the thing that attract private investments. That's why it becomes so critically important for the government to, and this is the opposite, by, by the way, this is the opposite, the absolute opposite of trickle-down economics. I mean, trickle-down economics is this absurd notion that if you give the rich more money or let them keep more of so-called their money, as if it's their money, as if it's they don't belong to a society, as if they got to where they are on their own steam and not because of where they live and what investments were already made in them. But if you, if you cut their taxes, somehow it trickles down to everybody else. Well, obviously, that is not true because starting in 1979, at the end of the, we know this, at the time, I wasn't sure about it, and, mo, and economists didn't really know it. We didn't look at the data the way we should have. But starting in 1979, uh, wages began to flatten for most people. The median wage. Now when I say median, that's different from average. You know, the basketball player Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six foot four. <laughs> People at the top always bring up the average. So what you want to do, if you want, if you want to understand where Americans are with regard to income and wealth, you look at the median. And starting in the late 70s, the median started to flatten, adjusted for inflation. You always have to adjust for inflation, which was something new because in the three decades after the Second World War, the median grow, grew with productivity improvements. In fact, most economists and most analysts who looked at it assumed that as, you, as the economy become, became larger, as productivity improved, that that would mean everybody's wages would go up. And that was kind of, that was, that was orthodoxy. And then, somehow, something changed. And trickle-down economics would, was the exact opposite of what you wanted to do to empower people to grow the middle class, to overcome inequality. And Ronald Reagan tried it, and it didn't work. And so Bill Clinton was, was determined to do something very different. And I was excited by that. I, I, I felt that he was right, and we were launched on something that was exceedingly important. Uh, but then something happened. And the something that happened is an interesting story that I still don't fully understand, but I think it, it has to do with money and politics, it has to do with Wall Street, it has to do with big corporations and their power. But essentially, Hillary Clinton tried to do health care, as many of you remember, and it was a failure, and even though the Democrats were a majority in both houses of Congress, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton couldn't get health care reform through, and I was trying, meanwhile, to do labor law reform, which meant making it easier for people to form unions, and I couldn't get anywhere with that. And it seemed like everything we tried was, was, was getting blocked. But how could it get blocked if the Democrats had both the House and the Senate? And the Democrats had the presidency. I mean, what it, I mean isn't it true that if you have a Democratic Party and you have all, both houses of Congress and the presidency, you're supposed to be able to do that kind of thing? I mean, isn't that what... Well, I was naive. We couldn't do it. There were other cabinet members. A very nice man, by the way. I, I liked him a lot. No, I'm, I'm serious. I, I did. A, a fellow named Bob Rubin. Bob Rubin, who was, eventually became Secretary of the Treasury. Larry Summers was there. Uh, there were people who... Here's the problem. They were nice, likable people, but they viewed the economy very differently. 
more like Republican light, if there's a way of expressing it that way. You know, that the market knows best. And so we had a lot of fights, good-natured fights, because it wasn't, it wasn't kind of, you know, in Washington, it's, a lot of it is, is uh, well, there are knives out all the time. In Washington, a friend is somebody who stabs you in the front. But even so, it was a, it, you know, there were a lot of fights and, and I have a lot, I still have a lot of scars. Uh, and then you remember Bill Clinton and the Democrats lost big in the midterm elections and Newt Gingrich came and became the kind of new boss of Washington, Speaker of the House. Uh, I don't like to speak ill of anybody but he is a dreadful person. <laughs> no, really, he, I, I don't, I don't. He's not here to defend himself, and that's good. No, he's a terrible person, and, um, and he brought in some terrible people. Uh, I would, as Secretary of Labor, I'd, I'd testify on the Hill, and some of the people that Newt Gingrich brought in were so nasty. I mean, the, the nastiness that we have today starts really then. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of the incredible kind of anger. And I remember I, I testified one day, um, shortly after Gingrich and his crew came in, uh, and uh, I, one member of Congress named Duke Cunningham. Anybody remember Duke Cunningham? He, I think he represented San Diego, didn't he? And he, uh, Duke Cunningham, he's now in prison. Or didn't he go to prison? Good. Uh, because, because Duke Cunningham, he stops me mid-sentence, I'm trying to testify, and he says, he says, um, he says, Mr. Secretary, I've read all of your books, all of your articles, and I've also read Karl Marx, and tell me, is there any difference? And I thought it was a joke. I turned to my assistant and said, he's joking, right? I can make a wise, a kind of a wise crack response. And she said, no, he's serious. Uh, and, and that was, uh, no, it was a terrible period of time. Now, how do all of these dots connect? They connect in the following way. Because beginning in the late 70s and right through the 80s and right up through the pe period I'm talking about, most Americans did not have a raise. In fact, if you were a man and you were in the workforce and you didn't have a college degree, adjusted for inflation, your wages were actually dropping. Women came into the workforce, particularly middle class women and working class women, in order to prop up family incomes because wages were dropping for men. And so what had been in the 50s and 60s a typical one earner household for many blue collar families and working class families and middle class families became the, the necessity of two wage earners. That changed a lot. And I remember when I was labor secretary, I'd go out to places like Toledo and Detroit and Buffalo and Kansas City. You know, when you're a secretary of Treasury, you go to Paris and London and, and Beijing and all these. No, when you're Labor Secretary, you go to where the working people are. And I talk to people, and I had meetings, people, you know, about a lot of meetings, about this size, and I talk about what we're doing and what's on your mind, and people would be upset and angry. They'd say, I'm working harder than ever, and I'm getting nowhere. Now, put a flag down on that anger. That was there. It was there in the 90s. It was there in the, started to be there in the 80s. But it grew. Bill Clinton could not, or some would say, and sometimes if I wake up in a bad mood, I say would not do the things that he needed to do. He would say he couldn't because the Republicans ran Congress after 1995, I would say, well, why didn't we do it when the Democrats were in charge? 
But the anger kept growing. And I left Bill Clinton's administration. I left because I was becoming less and less effectual. I mean, I was, you know, you, you know when you are having less impact when people stop listening to you, when their eyes begin to roll whenever you open your mouth, or when they avoid you, or when they don't invite you to meetings. That's a good sign that maybe you have overstayed your welcome. Uh, I left, and also I had two little boys. Let me not hasten to say, big, big part of my life, they are not now little boys. I call them my boys, but they're now, you know, mid-30s. They're men. They're my men. But then they were little boys, and I wasn't seeing anything of them. And, and one of them said to me one night, when I was not being listened to, remember, I'm not being listened to. I'm making all these arguments that I think are important about investing in people and looking at widening inequality and looking at, at, at how we can protect people, who workers who need protection, and nobody's listening, and the Republicans are yelling at me and calling me a Marxist. And then I have this little boy who's saying, Daddy, what time are you coming home? And I said, I don't know. And he said, tell me, at least when you get home, wake me up so you can hug me. And I just thought, forget it. So, so I left. And then Bill Clinton did a bunch of other things. Uh, I met Monica Lewinsky once in passing. Uh, but it was a horrible end to that administration. And there was also, they got rid of the Glass-Steagall Act, which was, I thought, pretty important in terms of keeping banks, commercial and investment banking, separate. And also, Brooks Lee Bourne, a, a, a woman who I actually admired a great deal, she went to Larry Summers and Bill Clinton, and she went to Bob Rubin, and she said, you know what we have to do? We have got to regulate derivatives under the Commodity Futures Trading Act. She was chair of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and they said, no, we're not going to regulate derivatives. So, look, put all these dots together. You've got people who are angry, already angry. You've got deregulation of Wall Street. You've got a failure to do the kind of public investment we really needed to do, to turn things around. And then you've got the financial crisis of 2008. An almost logical consequence of deregulating Wall Street. And then what happens? You've got millions of people who lose their jobs and their homes or their savings or all three and then Wall Street gets bailed out. And homeowners who are underwater, they don't get bailed out. And then not a single Wall Street executive goes to jail. And when I go back out to Buffalo or to Toledo or to Kansas City, or many of the places where I had been, and I knew people by that time, and I would go out, and I went out again. People were not just upset and angry, they really were offended. They felt that nobody was listening to them. I heard again and again, the game is rigged. The game is rigged. Well, In 2015, when I visited the Rust Belt and the Midwest and red states and some blue states, 2015, a good 18, 19 months before the election, I would talk to people, working class people, who are you, gonna, who are you thinking about voting for, I would say. And they would say to me, well, we're thinking about, really two, two people attract us. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And I'd say, what? How can you utter those two names in the same sentence? They're, a different, they're on different planets. And people would say back to me, no, 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 you don't, you don't get it. They will shake things up. They will shake things up. 
In other words, they are the two anti-establishment candidates. And most of the people I talked to did not make a distinction between what we now, or now it's pretty obvious to me, it was obvious to me then, is authoritarian populism. A very dangerous demagogic populism on the one hand, and democratic, small d, or progressive populism, on the other hand. And so now we have Donald Trump, and the country is deeply divided. And I look back on my 50 years and wonder, how did this happen? I was born in 1946. Bill Clinton was born in 1946. George W. Bush was born in 1946. Donald Trump was born in 1946. Dolly Parton. <laughs> Cher. I mean, anybody, anybody who's anybody was born in 1946. <laughs> Demographers, very, demographers want to know, very often, actually I've had conversations with demographers who want to know why is it that uh, you had the baby boom? The baby boom began in 1946. 76 million boomers born between 1976 and 1964. How did that happen? They scratched their heads. Well, it's not rocket science. <laughs> My father was in the Second World War and he came back And there was my mother. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and it was similar, I suspect, for Bill Clinton and for George W. and for little Donald. Can you imagine him as a little... So I look back on this baby boob generation, and you, you know, we had a, there was a lot of promise, I think. But in many ways, and I don't want to blame a generation, that's silly. But in many ways, we didn't or haven't yet done what we should have done. Now, let me just conclude by saying what may be odd for me to say after having taken you on this little autobiographical journey, uh, but I am very optimistic. And you may ask yourself, well, why? Why? How can you be optimistic? I'm optimistic. I am optimistic. I'm optimistic for a bunch of reasons. Number one, I'm optimistic because I am also a student of history and I know that this country, whenever we get off track in terms of inequality or political corruption, as we did in the 1830s and we did again in the 1890s, the Gilded Age of robber barons, and we did again to a large extent in the 1920s, and then some would say we did again in the 60s, but Whenever we get off track, we're very practical. We do not indulge in ideology. We talk ideologically sometimes, but when the going gets rough, we ro roll up our sleeves and we get on with what has to be done. In the progressive era, after the Gilded Age, the first Gilded Age, we reformed American politics. We reformed the economy. We did it. We did it again in the 30s with the fifth cousin of Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin D. We worked hard in the 50s and 60s. The accomplishments of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act and Medicare and Medicaid and then the Environmental Protection Act. I mean, these are, these are huge accomplishments. We did it. So when the Going gets tough and we get off track, we do, we do as a nation move to reform. Well, what makes me think we're going to do it this time? Well, for one thing, 
It's the young people. I mean, when I've not been in government, I have been teaching. I've been teaching at universities. And what I'm about to say is not just Cal, because I do visiting lectures at the University of Chicago, at places that are very different from Cal. But in my experience over my career as a teacher, I've never ever encountered a generation of young people who are as committed and dedicated and engaged and idealistic and desirous of a better country and a better world than this generation right now. And that is a big deal. I mean, just look at those kids in, in Florida and Parkland. I mean, have you ever come across more articulate, eloquent, powerful, powerful group of kids? Emma Gonzalez. I mean, isn't that all of them? Well, that's our future. And that makes me proud and very confident. Uh, here's another reason I think there is a silver lining on this dark Trump cloud. And that is that it is human nature that we don't value things until we're about to lose them. And I think that the last year and a half have made more of us more aware of our democracy, the fragility of our democracy, the need for our own political engagement than I recall at any time since the Vietnam War. And I know so many people, many of you, who are engaged and active and politically active and you understand that citizenship is not just about voting or jury duty or paying taxes. Citizenship is about engagement, active engagement. And that is what I see. You know how many women are running for office? <laughs> Extraordinary. And the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement and the Never Again movement and all of this outpouring of activism is in response to the sudden awareness that we can't lose this country. And this is important and big and positive. So even though every other day I get up and I'm a little bit anxious, and like many of you, I am stressed a lot by what's going on, I am very, very positive and optimistic about the future. And on that note, I will end and invite your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I heard that. Um, you're going to uh, go oh, uh, ask people to line up in the two aisles, and you'll give. Uh, li okay, line up in the two aisles, if you have questions, and there are two mics um, that you have. And if you don't have any questions, well, I wasn't that boring. I mean, there, there, are, there, you, there must be some questions you have. And just go, yeah, just go line up there, and if you could... But here, oh, I have a request. In terms, of, in terms of questions, if you could actually, this is Berkeley, and if you could just ask the question rather than give a comment, okay? So, uh, sorry sorry yes. to return back to Trump, but if he does fire Mueller, or um, anybody else, sort of, if he wants to stop this investigation, the constitutional crisis is going to follow. 
beyond the protests and hopefully massive protests on the streets, what do you think will follow? Uh, like, so what, what, what will, will, fo what will the, follow if yes. he fires Mueller? Right. And, uh, and I think he will. My betting is he will. Um, and if he does, well, number one, remember everything that Mueller, Mueller, it's not just Mueller. I mean, you've got a whole team and they have a lot of evidence. And we've got to make sure, and the Senate has, interestingly, almost a bipartisan agreement about doing several things to protect Mueller, but at the very least, they will, I believe, make moves to protect the evidence. So that's a little thing, but it's not so little. Because Richard Nixon, when he fired Archibald Cox, all that evidence went to the White House. Did you remember that? I don't yes, remember. The no, I don't well, remember. Yeah, well, I don't, look, I'm, not, I'm make, making uh, light of this. Uh, there will be a lot of litigation. Uh, I think there will be, it will probably go to the Supreme Court in terms of what a president can do with regard to a special counsel under the law. And I'm not sure whether this Supreme Court will back Trump or not, but ultimately, ultimately, this is going to be decided at the ballot box. This is all about voting. And let me just say quickly something about this. Because Donald Trump got 27% of the vote. Hillary Clinton got a little bit more than that. Which, if you do the mathematics, you can see that the largest party in America is not Democrats or Republicans, it's the party of non-voters. And that's especially true of the midterms. Only 40% typically vote in a midterm election. So it's all turnout. It's all turnout. And we are a little bit handicapped here in the blue state, in the bluest city, in the bluest county of the bluest state, of the bluest part of the country. But, uh, but that means that we've got to fan out. We've got to call our relatives and friends in other states, in purple states. Does anybody have any relative or friend in a, when I say purple state, I mean a state that is up for grabs? Does anybody have any relatives or friends in red states or purple states? Anybody? Put up your hand. Because you can make a lot of calls, you can even FaceTime, you can, you can actually have a big influence if all of us did that. And I think uh, you might even want to, I, I dare say, you might even want to take some time, if you can, and go to these places and go door to door and get out the vote in November. Anyway, yes. Hi, you mentioned the press, and I want to hear your take on that, but mostly I want to hear what you think we can do about the press. What can we do about the press? Well, I, I think that we, number one, have an obligation, all of us, to do whatever we can to defend its independence. <laughs> you know, I, I, having, having served in government, having served in administration, I have a lot of memories, a lot of experiences with the press that I thought was very biased. And you, that's inevitable. If you're in the government, you're going to be angry at the press. Uh, I remember uh, <laughs> I, one anecdote. Uh, years ago, I was actually, I, I, was, I was advising Michael Dukakis. Does anybody remember Michael Dukakis? <laughs> Nobody else does. You do. Um, and Michael Dukakis uh, was running for president. He got the Democratic nomination. Uh, this was 1988. And um, I was one of his advisors, and uh, CBS News came, and they asked me to talk about him, and, uh, you know, what do I think about him? And, the, and I just, just it, nothing but praise came out of my mouth. Everything that he did was wonderful, and, and the correspondent said to me, well, certainly there must be, to, make, to be credible about everything else you've said, you've got to give us something that is not quite that wonderful. And I fell for it. And I said, well, he can be a little stubborn. Boom, that's the only thing that made CBS News that evening. And I just felt, you know, and, and after I had been Secretary of Labor, and I just felt the press was just uh, terribly 
sensational and biased. And, but listen, it is the one thing standing be, between us and fascism. Uh, so, uh, and every time Trump attacks the press, that fake news business sends chills up my spine, as it should all of you. Yes. In terms of hope, how do you feel about a ticket with Joe Biden as president and <clears throat> Kamala Harris as vice president? Fine. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Uh, but 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 let me let me just say, uh, quite honestly, I, I think that the Democrats would be wise to put somebody on the head of the ticket who is under fifty. Now, I say that you know I, I love Joe Biden and I love Bernie Sanders and I really admire and love Elizabeth Warren and a lot of them I've known and I've worked with for years. Uh, but I just think we have to signal, if we're Democrats, that we are a, a new generation of people and we are younger and we are, you know, I don't want to in any way demean me. <laughs> but you know what I mean. You know, you get it. Okay. Yes. Professor, the fairness doctrine, I miss it. I have conservative friends. And I'll say uh, some brilliant an uh, analysis of the news, and all I get back is Fox News in my face. I, you know, Jack, it's just a witch hunt, you know, something like this. We have this gigantic propaganda machine that it's got to stop. Yeah, it is. I, I, fr quite frankly, uh, in the 1990s, we didn't have it. Uh, we had Rush Limbaugh on radio, but we didn't have Fox News. Fox News was, uh, you know, Roger Ailes created this at the end of the 90s. Uh, and as bad as it was, I never really thought of it until the last year and a half, two years, including the primary, including the uh, election, as a propaganda machine, a kind of Joseph Goebbels propaganda machine. But it is, it is a propaganda machine, and it has become one. There's no difference and no light between Sean Hannity and Donald Trump. And unfortunately, the initiative, the brains, start with Hannity. And Trump picks it up, and then Hannity repeats it, and the Fox and Friends. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a closed loop, and it's very dangerous. And I've talked to people, many people, when I go out to red states or to red cities, so-called, it's ironic, isn't it, that color... considering where we've been. Uh, and I go out and I talk to people, it, it, if they have been no doing nothing but watching Fox News, it's as if I'm talking to Martians or people from another planet. I mean, they're, they're, their entire worldview, their universe is so... <laughs> yes. So my question is, what are your thoughts on the state of unions right now? with states like Wisconsin doing the right to work and the Supreme Court is very anti-union. So I was wondering, as a former labor secretary, what your thoughts are? Well, unions, uh, just to give you an idea of what's happened, in 1955, 19, even as late as 1960, one out of three American workers in the private sector was unionized. And that was enough to give unions not only power, to set the terms of the private sector because all of the other employers who were not unionized had to go along with prevailing wages and hours and, and, and working conditions and, and benefits or else they knew they would be unionized. And that gave working people, one out of three, that gave them a huge voice and bargaining leverage. And now today, if you look at the private sector, it's fewer than 7% are unionized. Unions have shrunk to almost nothing. Public sector unions are larger, but how long is that going to? The Janus, Janus decision is, is waiting there in the Supreme Court. So I think unions are in trouble, and I think we are all in trouble because of it, but uh, the service 
workers' unions, SEIU, HERE, uh, in fact, even the UAW is getting into service work. Those unions representing retail, restaurant, hotel, hospital workers, surface transportation workers, eventually child care, elder care workers, they need representation, they need a voice, and those unions are moving into those areas very rapidly, and I think that's very healthy. I think that's a good thing. So, am I optimistic? Cautiously, yes. I'd like to know your thoughts about the controversies between supporting progressive Democrats on the one hand versus moderate Democrats on the other, and how that plays into the likelihood of retaking one or both houses of Congress. And if we were able to do that, what reforms do you think we could have besides blocking the Trump agenda? Well, uh, good question. Uh, I think for 2018, I th am willing to support any Democrat. Uh, because we've got, to get, we've got to get the House back. I mean, that's just necessary. It's going to be hard. The gerrymandering means that overall, if you look at the total popular vote for House seats, Democrats are going to need a margin of over 11% over Republicans to take back the House because of gerrymandering. But... I think it's possible. It's not going to be easy, but I think it's possible. Uh, I just saw an analysis of the Senate. Now, Senate seemed to me imp totally impossible, given how many Democratic senators were up for re-election versus Republicans. But I think it, you know, uh, it's, pos it's possible. Again, it's all turnout. Now, 2020. I would urge Democrats, and I have urged Democrats, to give up this notion that it's moderate versus left versus right, it's not. The real action, the real energy in the Democratic Party, just like the Republican Party, is the anti-establishment. And if we don't activate, and I mean activate in a real way, African Americans and young people and women and all of the people who, who want the Democrat Party to be a force, a bold force for change, who want the Democratic Party to do something. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, when I talked about flat wages and widening inequality and less and less job stability, uh, you know, Democrats should be coming up with big ideas. They should be coming up with, uh, you know, universal basic income, with, with, uh, with, with a kind of uh, federal jobs guarantee for everyone. They should be, talk they should be talking about single payer. Proudly, they should be talking about it. You know, they Democrats need to be talking about getting big money out of politics, and they should be talking about ways of doing it. But, you know, I love Hillary Clinton. I mean, I'm not in love, and we didn't... Our date was really very disappointing in many ways. But, but I was so disappointed with that campaign. I mean, it just... Sorry? What movie did we see? We saw... Blow Up. Do you remember Blow Up? Who was the... Um, Antonioni. Antonio. We went to the Nugget Theater in Hanover, New Hampshire, and we saw Blow Up, and she really did want a lot of butter on her popcorn. <laughs> yes? Uh, one of the more successful parts of Trump's campaign platform was uh, his sort of anti-trade policies, and uh, these resonated specifically well with uh, some of the disenfranchised, angry people that you were alluded to earlier. But I think there's a lot of economic evidence that shows that trade can make everyone better off, uh, so my question is, how can we advocate for trade for some of the people that potentially would make better off but are strongly against it? I think the only way that blue-collar America, uh, and I'm talking primarily about people without college educations, which are still people who are still in the mi in my majority, uh, the only way that they can be comfortable with trade is if we move from an unemployment insurance system to a real 
reemployment system that enables people to have some confidence that if they lose their job, they're going to get a new one that pays as much or better. Now, what that means as a practical matter is you have wage insurance. So if you lose your, if, you're, if your next job doesn't pay as much, it, the difference is still going to be paid for. Uh, you have help moving from areas of the country where you're losing jobs to areas of the country that are gaining jobs. One of the big problems today is basically rural America, including places like Upper New York State and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of places that used to be quite active economically are, are now gone. We, we need to have a very active industrial policy in this country, and we don't have anything. We don't have anything. And I think it's going to be very hard to be credible, because for so many years we've talked about this, but we've never done anything. Trade adjustment assistance. The other thing I think is very important for Democrats to say, and it's the truth, is that jobs are much more threatened by technology today than they are by trade. And, uh, and, and we have, we're facing a wave of artificial intelligence, robots, uh, machine tools, uh, that are going to really obliterate vast numbers of jobs, uh, particularly in places where you've got a lot of labor. I mean, not just retail, but professionals, healthcare, and education. And, well, you start losing some of those professional jobs, you gain the political will to do something big. Yes? Hi, um, I appreciate the historical slash autobiographical presentation and also connecting the dots for us and also the forward looking. But um, I'm just kind of curious, what do you think we'd be talking about had Hillary been elected? Well, I think that if Hillary had been elected, she would be facing a lot of the same obstructionism and hatefulness and, and Fox News stuff that Obama faced, and maybe even worse. So I'm not sure she could have got that much done legislatively. Now, had she been elected with a Democratic House and Senate, well, if pigs could fly, I mean, yes, it would be great, but I don't know, I don't know how that could have happened. You see, we're, what I wanted to emphasize with you is that we are living with a legacy of 35 years of failure to really grapple with a big economic and social problem and a set of problems. And so uh, I don't know that Hillary could have done anything. Certainly, I, I doubt that she could have done anything proportional to the size of the problem. She didn't lay the groundwork for it. I, you know, I had so many discussions with her policy people about her policies. She, she had wonderful policies there. Hillary's policies would have been caused my colleagues at the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley to be wildly excited. But nobody in America knew what those policies were because they were all respectable and tiny. And the only thing people heard in that whole election was emails. If you're not going to be bold, if you're not going to say something that is really large and aspirational, it's not going to break through. Particularly if, I mean, it's, it won't break through in any way, but if you have a, a crazy, narcissistic, you know, you know what I mean. I mean, you, <laughs> you're not going to, it's hard to break through. He, was, he dominated the news. This gets back to the news a little bit. I, I don't know how many of you remember Leslie Moonves, the head of, I think, CBS News, when he said at the end of the campaign, as Donald Trump was attacking him and all of the other producers for all the news programs, he said, bring it on. We've, we're doing better now than we've done in years. You know, our news division is now a profit center. Well, that's a danger. That is a huge danger. When news becomes a major profit center because it's sensationalized, then we're, all, we're really in trouble. I want to bring it uh, closer to the Bay Area. Uh, we see um, many more homeless people around. 
What's your uh, opinion of the reason and what's your uh, suggestion for solutions? Uh, we're, first of all, we've got to understand homelessness. There's not one cause of homelessness. There are many causes. But one of the big causes is the price of housing. And we've got a housing, a major housing problem here. I mean, I, 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 I talk to many people around the Bay Area who say, you know, I can barely afford it, but my kids will never be able to afford it. And a lot of service workers, contract workers, who say, I can, I can just about afford the rent, but I'm, I'm moving further and further out. The commutes are getting longer and more difficult. Well, homelessness is not unrelated to all of this. I mean, San Francisco is basically now becoming a different city than when I moved here 12 years ago. It's now a city for the rich and the homeless, and maybe there are a few people in between. But that's... That's remediable, but it's only going to be solved if you've got courageous politicians and you've got a lot of people, middle class and wealthy, who say, I'm going to give up the NIMBY stuff. I'm going to be willing to have lower income housing around here. I mean, the bill that just got that failed in the legislature, you know that. I think that was a... That was wrong. Yeah. Oh, hello, Professor. So uh, I feel like the audience seen here tonight are really different group of people than Trump supporters or Republican <laughs> supporters. Yeah, so I was just wondering how would you explain or justify your optimism to them? Because I think like even to this date, like a year, like more than a year after he, since he got into his presidency, a lot of his supporters still think like he is a uh, hope. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the, the, a lot of Trump supporters do still feel that he is the hope for them, that he is the voice for them. He is posing still as a populist, even though he failed to drain the swamp. He's made a bigger swamp. There are more crocodiles, alligators. It's, 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 a, it's a stinkier swamp than it ever was. He's made people feel as if, some of those Trump supporters, as if they are better off, when in fact, the big winners from the tax cut were obviously people at the very top. And people who are blue collar workers or lower middle class are getting almost nothing out of it. I mean, he's continued to pull the wool over their eyes with, by lying, this is demagoguery. Well, how long will that last? I mean, my, my, my prediction, honestly, is that about 20% of America, or maybe even 30%, will continue to support him because they're not listening. They don't want to listen. They don't care. They've made up their minds. They like him. They think he's honest. And they think he's honest because he speaks his mind, not because he tells the truth. But they're so fed up with politicians who don't speak their mind and are politically correct or not authentic that they really like him. And he gives them an excuse and he gives the legitimacy to their bigotry. And they like that. So I don't think necessarily we're ever going to get them to support anybody else, but they're not a majority. And let's remember that. I yes. want to take you back to your economic days, and I want to uh, ask you a real softball question. Uh, when should we expect the next recession? What do I when, expect? When should we expect the next, re next recession? When do I expect the next yes. recession? Real softball um, for you here. I expect the next recession uh, to begin September 8th. You know, I, I... Do you remember what happened in October, late October 1987? Do you remember when the stock market just... the, the, the bottom fell out of it? Um, two weeks before that, I was giving a talk 
And I said, and this was, this was recorded, I said in two weeks, the stock market is going to lose 20% of its value. And in almost exactly two weeks, it lost 20% of its value. And I was deluged with letters and phone calls, people wanting to sign up for my investment letter. <laughs> what I didn't tell them is that that prediction, two weeks, 20% loss, I'd been making the same prediction for four years. <laughs> so, you know, eventually, if, if you just stick to your guns, you can have your own investment letter. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear you speak about how you think Citizens United has impacted politics and how much dark money is actually involved in, and what we can do to get it out of our system. Yeah. Well, Citizens United uh, has obviously opened the floodgates, but the floodgates were already fairly open before Citizens United. I mean, I was there in the 90s before Citizens United, and a huge amount of money was pouring into Washington. Uh, and, uh, I mean, even Bill Clinton was renting the Lincoln bedroom to very wealthy people. I mean, somebody, somebody quipped to me, maybe it became more generally a quip, that uh, the Lincoln bedroom was the only bedroom, the only hotel room where the guest left a mint on the pillow. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but you see, Citizens United is a problem, but I think it is possible, even if it is not overruled or somehow repealed, it's possible to do a lot of things. Public finance, generous public finance of all elections, financed in turn by a small checkoff on your tax return, that could do a lot, particularly if you have public finance that is matched with small contributions instead of large contributions. Uh, full disclosure of all sources of campaign financing for or against a candidate. Getting rid of dark money. Getting a slowing or stopping the revolving door between business and government. I mean, there are all kinds of things that can be done, even if Citizens United stays there, that will, will help a lot. Remember, Bernie Sanders got 22 states on the basis of tiny, relatively small contributions. Nobody thought that was possible. So, yes, Citizens United is a big problem, but there is much that can be done, notwithstanding. Given the uh, Trump presidency, there's been a lot of talk of impeachment. So I'm wondering if you could speak about the pros and cons of the impeachment process and whether the 25th Amendment is a possible uh, alternative. Well, Donald Trump will not be impeached. I'm sorry to say that to those of you who are hoping that he will be, but there's never been a president in American history who's been convicted of impeachment. In other words, the House has impeached three times or actually twice, and the Senate has not voted out an impeachment resolution either for Clinton or for Andrew Johnson. And Richard Nixon resigned before those impeachment proceedings even started. So it's very hard to impeach a president. The public doesn't really like impeachment, and I don't think uh, the 20, and the 25th Amendment has never been tried. Now, if Trump really does act in a way that becomes evident to most Americans that he is stark raving mad. Yes, you will have some movement to get him out some way, uh, but that's not likely. It's just not likely. I think we've got to be realistic about this. I mean, the, I want to emphasize again, it's the ballot box. It's voting. That's the issue. That's the answer. That's the only way. Is there some, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, tonight you told a story about how the Democratic side lost its connection to the American people. Do you think it's the same story on the Republican side? Because they also lost it 
the Bushes have been ignored. I know the Houston newspaper came out for Hillary Clinton, which was completely shocking, and it had no influence. So is it the same story, or is there another layer or piece to it? Well, the, look, the Republican Party is badly split. I mean, you've got the big business Republicans, Wall Street, big corporations. That's where most of the money comes from. And those people are embarrassed and sometimes horrified. Some of them are very upset by Trump. They have not spoken up. They've not stood up. I think that is a, I say shame on them. I wrote a column excoriating a guy who is the head of the biggest bank in America, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, who is also the head of the business round table. But he's, at the same time, he has not stood up to Trump. He's sort of a sycophant. And I called him a sycophant. His name is Jamie Dimon. And uh, three days ago, he called me at my office at Cal. And he said, who do you think you are calling me a sycophant? And I said, you're a sycophant. <laughs> and, I, and, and we really actually did spend 15 minutes yelling at each other. Uh, we didn't persuade, obviously, I didn't persuade him of anything, anything but um, I think it is really important that the business community of America, they have occasionally been before, uh, stand up and stop this madness because they're going to lose out. You know, they're going to lose out if we don't do anything about a large and growing population of blue-collar people who are angry, if a, a poor and poverty population keeps growing. You know, we've got 13, almost 14,000 children in Los Angeles who are homeless. I mean, how can you expect to actually have a stable democracy with a growing middle class capable of buying all your goods and services if we're going in the direction we're going. You can't. But where's the courage? The Republicans themselves in Congress are not going to be courageous unless their sponsors, their money sources have some courage. I mean, there are a few John McCain's and Flakes. I, wasn't, isn't it amazing that you've got Arizona? I mean, who would have thought, why Arizona? You've got some real courage out there in Arizona. Yes. Well, I was very heartened to hear how optimistic you are, but I also noticed that you haven't said a word about the environment. And I wonder, given that we do live on planet Earth and it is an important context for all of this, are you really optimistic? <laughs> no. That's why I left the environment out. Uh, but let me, just say a, 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 let me just say a few things about the environment. I, I, I have been pleasantly surprised at how quickly renewables, particularly wind and solar, have become highly competitive. In fact, actually, on a, any kind of reasonable cost basis, are cheaper than fossil fuels now. I mean, nobody would have expected that 10 years ago. Um, I've also been impressed at the leadership of California. And I think all of us can be really proud of that. Because with one out of every eight Americans living in this state, and with a state that is basically the equivalent of uh, the sixth largest economy in the world, when we do something on the environment, it requires that everybody else, every manufacturer, do it. Uh, and I think that if it comes down to it and there is a civil war between Washington, Pruitt, and California, I think we'll win. But I am very worried about overall the environment. Anybody, any, everybody has to be. And it's, and, and it's you know, what, what's worrisome, and I'll bring it back to my theme about rich and poor, it's the poor who are getting, around the world, who are suffering from environmental disasters. You know, the rich are rich enough, they can't avoid all of them, but they can avoid many. And even in the United States, it's the poor and the, again, the working class. When you're talking about floods and fires and 
mudslides and lack of water. I mean, but we've got to be talking, all of us, about environmental justice at the same time we talk about climate change. I think too often uh, a lot of working class people think of the environmentalists as elitists who don't care about jobs, and that's not true. There are more jobs in, for example, solar and wind now than there are in coal, far more, far more. Donald Trump is trying to protect the coal industry? Hello, what is that all about? Well, it's all about West Virginia and Pennsylvania, but that makes no sense. So I think I've exhausted you all. <laughs> um, but let me, just, uh, let me just summarize by saying that I, all of us are so fortunate to be living in the Bay Area. And we are so fortunate to be in the bubble we are in. It's dangerous, as I've talked about. I think it's important for all of us to reach out of our bubbles. I tell my students here at Cal, the most important thing you can do to learn, the best way to learn is to talk to people who disagree with you. Because people who disagree with you will force you to revise and sharpen your arguments and maybe even change them. But nevertheless, we are blessed. And every day I live here, I feel more and more blessed. And to you, my neighbors and my friends, I just say, let's all keep up the fight. Thank you. Thank you.